I would like to introduce Professor Scott Gaylord. He directs High Point Law's Appellate Litigation Clinic and serves as a professor of law teaching, teaching constitutional law and some other high-level elective courses. He also leads their appellate clinic. Professor Gaylord is a prominent constitutional law scholar with an impressive background in academia and legal practice. He's authored nearly 20 law review articles and more than 35 amicus briefs to the United States Supreme Court and other federal circuit courts. Professor Gaylord star also started an appellate advocacy clinic at his former law school and currently serves on the North Carolina Chief Justice's Commission on Professionalism. Prior to the academy, joining the academy in 2007, he practiced complex civil and commercial litigation with the Charlotte firm of Robinson, Bradshaw, and Henson. That's where I got to meet Professor Gaylord. Fun fact, his son also interned for Judge Frank Whitney in the Western District of North Carolina during a time when I served as Judge Whitney's career law clerk. Professor Gaylord earned his P BA in philosophy and English, summa cum laude from Colgate University, his PhD in philosophy from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and his JD from Notre Dame Law School. Professor Gaylord, thank you for leading this panel. Thank you, my pleasure. Well, good afternoon and welcome. I uh, really appreciate everybody being here for this afternoon. If you haven't been uh, caffeinating you know, appropriately today, don't worry, we've got a great panel, so uh, you'll be up and, and ready to go today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you, although I'm not sure who thought it was a good idea to give a law professor an open mic, but I will try to keep it, uh, my, my comments brief and quick. Just a couple points I'd like to uh, start with and then do the formal introductions and get to questions. Uh, first, I'd like to thank both Justice Riggs and Judge Griffin for um, their willingness to participate in this panel, uh, certainly in particular, but more generally for their service to our great state of North Carolina. You know, it takes a lot of courage and sacrifices, you know, for public service generally, but I think in the judiciary in particular, and I greatly appreciate their willing to serve. We need more people of goodwill who are willing to take on that responsibility. As we know, the judiciary does an incredible job, has a key role in our government, and I think all too often is underappreciated for everything that they do. And particularly in North Carolina, whatever one's view on judicial selection, whether you like elections or not, I think that just adds a whole nother level of commitment and dedication. So thank you both, greatly appreciate that. Second, uh, in terms of different things going across the nation with debates, I think everyone, our panelists and everyone else will be happy to know, no fact checking, no turning off mics. Our panelists don't need it. I couldn't do it even if I wanted to. So that makes that very easy. Uh, third, in terms of format, we're going to start with just a couple minutes of opening statements by both of the, the candidates and our panelists today. Uh, then we'll go into some general questions. I'll get a chance for uh, some conclusory remarks, and then we'll open up questions from the floor from attendees who would like to ask questions, uh, all trying to shoot for we're about a 445 hard stop. Um, so that's what we'll be looking at. It is my pleasure then finally to introduce our panelists. Justice Riggs currently serves as an associate justice on the North Carolina Supreme Court. After putting herself through college, graduate school, and law school at the University of Florida, Justice Riggs spent 14 years as a civil rights and voting rights attorney at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice in Durham, North Carolina, becoming the co-executive director for programs and chief counsel for voting rights. Her work focused on ensuring fair elections and safe and healthy environments. And she argued cases in state courts across the South, in the Fourth and Fifth Circuits, and even two cases before the United States Supreme Court. Governor Cooper appointed Justice Riggs to the Court of Appeals in 2023, and then to the North Carolina Supreme Court. Judge Griffin currently serves on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. After graduating from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Judge Griffin earned his United States Coast Guard Captain's License, and later attended the North Carolina Central School of Law. In practice, Judge Griffin focused on civil litigation and criminal defense work before joining the Wake County District Attorney's Office. In 2010, Governor McCrory appointed him as a district court judge in Wake County, where he served until being elected to the North Carolina Court of Appeals in 2020. Judge Griffin served as the National Security Law Judge Advocate, deployed to the Middle East in 2019 through 2020, and continues to serve as a captain in the North Carolina Army National Guard. We're so pleased to have both of you here with us today, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be part of this panel. Based on our discussions, we're going to start with opening remarks with Justice Riggs. Thank you, Professor Gaylord. Thank you all uh, for joining this afternoon. I know you've had a busy day of 
um, content and discussion. I'm Justice Allison Riggs. I'm the newest member of the North Carolina Supreme Court, and I am just uh, honored to get to let you know know me a little bit more. Some of you have practiced with me over the years, um, so definitely see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, as Professor Gaylord mentioned, I, I came here via Florida, but I grew up in West Virginia, and my heart is with the folks in the mountains right now because I know what it's like to experience flooding in the mountains. But I was very honored um, to spend my career um, practicing in a practice that I loved. I had the unique experience of getting to have both a robust trial practice and an appellate practice, and I think too often nowadays folks don't get that, that experience, but conducting multi-week um, complex civil litigation trials and then taking your case up to argue at the United States Supreme Court is of course a huge honor. Many of the cases I filed uh, were constitutional cases, both under state constitutions across the South and the federal constitution. Um, and part of what I'm proud of too is that I got to represent folks who might not have had access to attorneys, but for the pro bono practice that we had. Um, so understanding where folks uh, didn't fully understand uh, the legal systems and the judicial processes, I think has helped make me a better judge um, and certainly human being. I am, um, uh, as, as Professor Gaylord mentioned, been on the bench now for nearly two years, uh, was really grateful for my service on the Court of Appeals, and I, I saw Chief Judge Dillon somewhere here, um, but really grateful for my colleague here and the work on the Court of Appeals, and I think that uh, service rounded out uh, what, I, what I hope to bring to the Supreme Court, which is a fresh, fresh perspective, balance on the court, um, critical thinking, and a willingness to kick the tires from every direction rather than just one uh, rigid or um, set mindset. I think when we ask questions from every angle, do a little um, devil's advocate um, examination from within the court and on the bench, we get to better law. Um, and so I've now served on the North Carolina Supreme Court for over a year, and my record is no longer hypothetical, and I hope to continue my service to you all and to the state of North Carolina. So really appreciate this and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Judge Griffin. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I've been able to spend some time with you today. I'm uh, Judge Griffin. I have the honor to serve you at the North Carolina Court of Appeals currently, uh, where I was statewide elected in 2020. Uh, Statewide elections are tough. We're in the, the short rows of this one. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my wife, Katie, for uh, all her support in this campaign. Um, we've got two small children, or young children, uh, approximately one in three. And so the last time we ran statewide in 2020, uh, I actually got mobilized um, with the Army National Guard here and spent a year abroad. Um, and so when we got to thinking about running for the Supreme Court and people asked us about doing it, Katie said, as long as you don't get deployed, uh, you can do it. You can do anything you want. So uh, we've uh, we jumped head head into this and it's been a great campaign so far. And I think I have a lot to offer the, uh, the citizens of North Carolina uh, on the North Carolina Supreme Court. Uh, as Scott said, I, I've been in the Court of Appeals since 2020. Uh, I've authored close to 250 opinions, sat on close to a thousand. Um, yeah, I bring practical experience in our state. Uh, I started in a rural area in private practice doing civil defense work and criminal defense. Uh, then moved to the district attorney's office, busiest courthouse in the state, worked under district attorney, elected DA, Colin Willoughby there. I uh, was able to um, try a lot of cases very quickly and gain that perspective. Uh, and, you know, talking to trial court judges across the state, uh, when we go on these conferences and I've been out campaigning, they want somebody who has that perspective, who's been in that courtroom, uh, who has sat in their chair as a trial court judge. Uh, and I think that is a very important perspective that we need and one that our Supreme Court lacks right now. Um, with Justice Morgan resigning to uh, run for governor, uh, we have no former trial court judges on the bench. And I can tell you from my conversations with trial court judges, practitioners and citizens, I think that's an important perspective. Um, yeah, my military service is a big part of what I do. I'm a, the senior defense counsel here in North Carolina now. 
Uh, I've worked both as a military prosecutor and as a, on the defense side. Uh, I think that's a very important perspective for a jurist uh, to have seen both sides uh, and to have done it uh, at a personal level. And I've done that both as a civilian and in the military. I think that is a very important perspective to add. And you know, looking at um, kind of our visions uh, for the judiciary, uh, how we interpret the law, and what we want for our state judiciary, I think uh, we have very different visions, and I think you'll see that uh, play out here during the, the forum. Thank you. I thought we'd start with uh, some sort of bigger, broader questions, some issues that have been in the news with judiciaries generally, both federal and state, and then sort of work our way down to North Carolina in particular. So starting in more broad, the legitimacy of the United States Supreme Court has been called into question over the last maybe several years, but I think the last year in particular, it's picked up speed with uh, concerns over trips, flag flying, shadow docket, stare decisis, and a bunch of other things. Um, do, you f do you think that the federal or state Supreme Court faces a legitimacy crisis, and why or why not? Start Justice Riggs again, and then go sure. from there. I think these are important questions that we're grappling with, and I think there are um, valid conversations to be had about this. I will say my larger zoomed out perspective is I don't feel entitled um, to the respect of the bar, the public, uh, voters at large. I am dedicated to earning that trust and faith and to maintaining it um, with my uh, defense of the Constitution and North Carolinians' rights. So I think when we have discussions about whether it's reforms that are needed um, on the court or how the public talks about the court, it's important to me that I, I center that humility that I don't, I don't believe judges are kings. And I think a, a belief that just because um, you know, we have to be careful about maintaining the independence of the courts does not on the far end mean that courts are not accountable. And our, in our North Carolina constitution, uh, we elect judges. And now we elect judges um, uh, you know, under a system that the legislature has picked. And so you know, I think at the federal level, there's a very different discussion and a different mechanism um, and viewpoint. And in the state courts, um, it is different, but I welcome uh, dialogue about how to build faith in our courts, how to make people understand what's happening in our courts, and at core in an election year, give voters the information they need to hold judges accountable when we do elect judges. Thank you. So I think a lot of it starts with civic education, it starts with the media. Uh, when you have the first thing that somebody says about a judge is, well, was he a Republican or a Democrat, or is he or she a Republican or Democrat? And that's what gets reported. And people in our, our state and our country now um, have a over politicized view of what the judiciary is or, or should be. Uh, and so I think a lot of it starts with civic education, uh, with making sure that our young people understand the separation of powers, uh, that they understand the role of the judiciary and of a judge. And that starts with us as jurists. We have to set the example for all of them. We don't need to be out there telling people how we're gonna vote on cases. We don't need to be out there telling folks how another judge is gonna vote on a case. We can't control what third parties are gonna do. This is like you know, stuff you learn in first grade, you can control your behavior. Uh, and so it goes back to us as jurists to make sure that we're leading the charge, to make sure that people have faith in our judiciary. Uh, and you know, I, I don't, uh, we do have races in our state now that are, um, there are labels, party labels on our ballot. That doesn't make me behave in a certain way. Those are personal choices that we each make. Um, and so I don't like it being framed. It, it is a, it's a policy decision. Uh, it's up to our General Assembly, but nobody there is making you make choices about your own campaign and how you decide to behave. Great. Following up with that, Judge Griffin, in, in terms of those concerns, President Biden has come out and said that we may need like ethics panels or some types of term limits. Do you think those are, one, necessary at either the federal or state level or prudent or impose their own threats to judicial independence? You know, I look at it more from a state perspective. The, the Fed side's not really in my lane right now. Um, anytime you... 
react to certain decisions from a court with those kind of, that kind of rhetoric or very reactionary um, threats about um, about a judge's decision or a juror's decision. Uh, I, I, I'm a little concerned about that from a different branch of government. Um, you know, I, the federal side, you know, they're, they're a little more isolated, obviously, with an appointment system. Um, we run eight years uh, for our seats. Um, so it's different. Uh, it's a different setup federal to, to state, um, but regardless of the entity, um, you know, coming out and, and uh, criticizing a judge or the judiciary uh, for a particular decision uh, or an opinion is not a, a comfortable place, I don't think, for our separation of powers. Great. Justice Riggs. Uh, so I have a, a slightly different perspective, um, albeit with the decisions being made in Congress right now are also not really in my focus over the next uh, next few weeks. Um, but I will say, I think this goes back to accountability. What Congress or President Biden propose to do if they are in response to um, the, w the voter, the will of the people, I think those are... Uh, conversations that the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the people are entitled to have. And I think when we uh, create systems where, um, you know, the money that we've received or the transparency that we use with our, our finances and our relationships um, is less than um, open and accessible to the public, then we should be willing and ready as a judiciary um, to hear some criticism and not be defensive about it. But I certainly don't think critiques of the court are out of bounds. I welcome them in a healthy functioning democracy. Um, it does not affect my, my course, which is to read the law and enforce the Constitution, apply the law to the facts, uh, but I welcome it. And I also, I remind people every day that a lot of the, these decisions are policy decisions that are outside the scope of what judges get to decide on. So I get to operate under the system that we have. I can share with you my experiences, share with the public what my experiences are. Um, in North Carolina recently, we, with partisan elections and with no judicial uh, public financing. I can share those perspectives, but um, only as information from someone who's navigating this system, not as someone recommending a policy way forward. Okay. Moving uh, directly towards North Carolina, you can start with you, Justice Riggs. What do you view as the greatest or biggest challenge confronting the North Carolina judicial system, and what would you do or think others need to do to help address that? So I think there's a couple of things we need to do in this state specifically. One is um, from a operation standpoint, continue to um, evolve with the times. There are technology challenges that we continue to grapple with. I think at core, it's an access to justice question. Uh, so striving to make sure that particularly rural parts of our state have access in the same way that folks in Raleigh or Charlotte or Durham do. Um, is a huge issue. I think uh, we see legal, huge legal deserts across this state, and um, it it may and and does affect what people think of the judicial system, the legal system. If they have trouble navigating it, if they have trouble engaging with it, uh, I think they're, the trust um, that equal justice under law will actually be delivered when you walk through those courthouse doors um, is it's undermined. And I think, lastly, I would, I think we, this is some common ground, I think there is civic education to be had. And when I go out and talk to folks about our courts and try and listen to what they know already and what they think, it's frequently, oh, that's where you go when you get in trouble. <laughs> and maybe, but there's an awful lot more that our judiciary and our, our justice system writ large can offer to the people of North Carolina, but only if they understand the resources available to them. So I consider my role one of public education as well, and that uh, my job doesn't end um, in my chambers. It's uh, about engaging with the public in a way that gives them information um, and allows them to better understand our court system. Thank you. 
Can you repeat the question, Scott? <laughs> sure. Uh, folks in North Carolina, what do you see a particular challenge in front of the North Carolina right. judicial system, gotcha. and what can you do, or what should others do to help address? No, that? I agree with Allison on the uh, the rural issues. I, you know, I encourage a lot of my staff and mentees to consider going um, out to rural areas. I started practicing in, in Lenore County. Uh, I missed a bar meeting and ended up being president of the bar. It's amazing how that works. Um, but uh, at a very, very uh, junior uh, status as a lawyer. Um, but there are tremendous opportunities to serve. Uh, and I think that's <clears throat> a little bit of that's missing is that our profession is about servant leadership. Um, and and I, you know, every time we swear somebody into the Court of Appeals, I, I remind them like, you're joining a profession. Uh, this is not a job. Like you're getting ready to take a oath. You've just taken a oath uh, to join this profession. And with that comes a lot of responsibility. It's, it's a great, great honor, but it's a lot of responsibility. And so um, growing up in rural Nash County, uh, practicing in a rural area, um, you know, representing indigent defendants, um, I understand a lot of those challenges there. And so I'm, I'm encouraged uh, that I, I have met younger lawyers that are willing to go back. I think that's something we can continue to do. Um, and that kind of feeds into the mentorship side of it. Uh, if we're mentoring, our young lawyers the way we should, uh, you know, and we have a good venue for that from the appellate bench especially. Uh, it was a little harder from the trial court bench for us just because it was so busy. Um, but from the appellate bench perspective, we have a great opportunity to mentor young lawyers in our state and tell them about servant leadership and tell them about uh, the obligation to give back. And uh, and so those are, those are uh, some areas that we can we can help, and then of course civic education as well, kind of hit hit the nail on the head with that one. Great. Is there, in terms of getting uh, giving folks a little bit better sense of each of your judicial philosophies, positions, is there a particular decision from the North Carolina Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, that you would say you really admire or embodies your judicial philosophy, and in what ways? Sorry, Judge Griffin. Uh yeah, I think uh, most recently the the second decision in Harper v. Hall, um, you know, the Chief Justice I think laid it out very well. Uh, it explained uh, judicial restraint, humility from the bench, uh, in a way that uh, it was a very long opinion, uh, but it was very uh, very thorough, uh, and I think it clearly showed the intent of the judiciary to stay in its lane and not legislate from the bench. And uh, and I, I think that's a as good an example as we've had recently here in North Carolina. Okay, Justice Ruiz. So it's it's kind of responsive, kind of not. I actually think it's more helpful for me to point to decisions of mine that I think inform you of my approach to the bench. So for a constitutional um, interpretation and how I approach uh, really weighty considerations that come with uh, the challenge that challenging a piece of North Carolina legislation as cons unconstitutional. I'd point you to McKinney v. Goins. Uh, it was a, a decision that I wrote uh, at the North Carolina Supreme Court, uh, sorry, at the North Carolina Court of Appeals about our law of the lands clause um, and uh, was just a really thorough deep dive into constitutional history and our jurisprudence in this state. And, um, encourage you to read it uh, and hold me uh, accountable for that. Um, and then more recently, for statutory interpretation, I'd, I'd point you all to uh, a decision that I wrote at the North Carolina Supreme Court, State v. Jonas, which was a criminal case interpreting a, a criminal statute and uh, was very pleased to be able to uh, build bridges in that case and, and hold a majority in a way that I think was honest um, intellectually, and uh, we found a good resolution in interpreting a tough statute. Great. Now, following up in a little bit with that, is there a particular jurist, either you know, federal, state, past or present, that um, sort of stands out to you, one of your favorite, someone you really admire in terms of their um, work as a jurist, their decision-making process, their writing, whatever it may be? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a little bit a, a personal story, but uh, Justice Kagan has 
meant something to me in my career. The first time I argued in the United States Supreme Court, I was eight years out of law school. So as you can imagine, I, I was a little nervous. Um, and I stood up at the podium and my clients were uh, in the Supreme Court with me. And she just gave me a gentle smile, um, nothing over the top, but it was a nonverbal signal that said to me, you're welcome here. Uh, you may not be part of the DC Supreme Court bar, but I know you worked hard to get here and I'm interested, make your best case. Um, and that's really informed how I sit as a judge too, that I recognize particularly when young attorneys are coming up and standing at that podium for the first time, that that is a career defining moment for them. And the way that I treat them, the nonverbal cues that I send to them can affect the trajectory of their entire career. I also think um, Justice Kagan is a, a pragmatist and uh, writes in a razor sharp, uh, clear manner that I, I respect. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of great opportunities to appear in front of a lot of judges in, across North Carolina, uh, especially when I was in the trial courts. Um, and there's lots of good stories there. Uh, you know, I, I have to, I have to mention Chief Justice Newby, and not for the necessarily the, the jurisprudence. Um, we probably generally have the same or similar judicial philosophy. Uh, however, he has uh, <laughs> graded my papers at the Supreme Court, and uh, we haven't always agreed um, from my Court of Appeals opinions. Um, but because of the way he has taught me how to treat people and how to carry himself uh, and how to mentor uh, those are skills that uh, I will um, take with me for life. Uh, and I mean, pretty, pretty interestingly, they, he, he has taught me to uh, pray for my opposition. Allison, you probably didn't know, I pray for you, Katie and I pray for you every day. Um, and so those, those things about him uh, are more special than what he does with the written word. Great. Yes, sir. Judge Griffin, there, sir, a certain way you would characterize your judicial philosophy, one, and then what has helped inform that for you? What types of experiences, readings, cases have helped you develop into this particular philosophy that you adhere to? Right. So, I mean, having been in the trial courts, having worked there, having uh, watched our appellate courts closely, um, has made me appreciate and understand the and value consistency. Uh, and I think as jurists, um, an originalist approach uh, is the most consistent way that we are practice humility, that we uh, don't become uh, the kings in the judiciary, uh, that we make sure the people are still in charge of the law. They're either their elected representatives uh, in the legislative bodies or any constitution they've ratified. Um, I interpret the law as it's written under what its original meaning is. Uh, anything other than that, and I think you cross into judicial activism. Uh, and, and I welcome uh, other perspectives on that. Uh, I would love to hear them articulated, uh, but I just don't see how you could be more consistent in the law uh, outside of that interpretation. And I've, you know, you talk about things I've, I've seen uh, when our jurists in our state at the trial court level and particularly at the appellate court level cross the line on that. Um, and it, it kind of circles back to your original question. Why do people lose faith in the judiciary? Uh, or why do they have problems or are concerned about the judiciary? Uh, it's because when they look at something and say, well, that's not the will of the people. That's not what we send our, our elected representatives uh, uh, pass that law, or we, uh, that was a constitution that we ratified, uh, not, not the judges. Um, and so I think that's, uh, that has, a lot of that has formed uh, how I interpret the law and how I look at it. Thank you. Justice Riggs. I think, I think this is probably one of the clearest, we'd probably both agree, one of the clearest points of contrast um, between Judge Griffin and I. I, my personal perspective is that uh, adopting a rigid um, inflexible judicial philosophy. Judicial philosophy has just become a code word 
for how you are, will vote or what your political ideology is. I think we are presented with a number of tools that help us as jurists. I think if what I, I have always appreciated from those on the bench that I appeared in front of uh, was critical thinking, curiosity, and uh, willing to kick the tires from different angles. And I think that means Yes, examining, you know, what did the founders mean um, in the 1700s, 1800s when they wrote this, but also what, what, where are we today? Um, but I, I, I also think it's, we have to be careful too, especially in modern technology. If, if all you're doing is rigidly applying originalism, we could create an artificial intelligence intelligence bot and get rid of judges full out. And maybe that's what some folks want. That's a dialogue we can have. But I think I want, uh, when I practiced and now, I want uh, to be joined with um, smart, critical thinkers, folks who are willing to discuss um, with different approaches and, and avoid groupthink. So I, I embrace a judicial methodology, not a judicial philosophy, which is I'm the, the only thing I'm rigid about is sort of how I go through each case um, step by step, starting with the decision below, because we are appellate courts, not trial courts. Um, and I understand where the, the factual records boundaries are. Um, and then concentric circles um, branch out to the cases I'm reading, uh, the briefs I'm reading, and how I'm incorporating a, things I would rely on into my review of the facts and application of the law to the facts. So I'm confident that that's what's going to get to the right answer. That along with constructive dialogue uh, with the fellow members uh, on your bench, because we aren't trial court judges, we have to um, make decisions together and I think uh, those a variety of perspectives and approaches ultimately ends up with better decisions and more clear law. Great. Uh, one, you know, provision that for reference uh, several different times um, with respect to North Carolina Constitution and the Bill of Rights states, uh, Section 35, a frequent recurrence of fundamental principles is absolutely necessary to preserve the blessings of liberty. End quote. What does that provision mean to you, Justice Riggs? It's a residual clause that I think reminds us um, not only the seriousness of every um, article um, before it and section before it, but um, that there is a broad grant of power um, and liberty, personal liberty, to people in this state from our state constitution. And I hope that everyone who serves on the bench reads Reads our, reads our Constitution with a sense of awe of what, what we have done in this state um, to defend personal freedoms and liberties. And every time you read it, um, recognize that each, each one of those um, fundamental principles are ones that are important and significant, not just the ones you like, not just the ones that are politically popular or in the news, uh, that we have to read the Constitution in its entirety, be committed to enforcing every guarantee in there. And remember that the, the liberties and the freedoms assigned uh, to each of us by the North Carolina Constitution, being as broad as it is, they're non-exhaustive. Um, so that's what Article 35, uh, Section 35 means to me. Thank you. Uh, Judge. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to the last question for a second on the, the assertion that my judicial philosophy is, uh, is some, in some way, um, able to be assumed that how I'm gonna proceed on a case or, or deliberate on a case. Uh, I, I don't think that's accurate. Um, I think it's clear and it's what we owe citizens of North Carolina to be able to explain to them how we're going to uh, interpret the law as jurists, that is our job. Um, so I don't think, and, and I think that assertion is also erroneous because there's 15 people on my, well, 14 other people on my current court right now. Uh, if you look at, and, and the fact that you, you said it was groupthink, uh, I think is inaccurate as well. Um, at our court, there's about a 6% dissent rate uh, overall. Uh, we sit in panels of three, and 
my dissent rate, meaning I've dissented on cases, is at 1%. Um, and so I am very thoughtful. Uh, I am, I think, effective at explaining my judicial philosophy and how I interpret cases. And um, I think members of my court from different judicial philosophies uh, have agreed with that, and I've been able to be persuasive there. Uh, so I don't think there's anything groupthink to it. I think it's just telling the truth. Um, as to the Declaration of Rights, it's, uh, I think it's, it is very um, instructive on how we should all live as citizens, uh, but in particular as jurists here in North Carolina, uh, that we remember we are stewards of these positions, that we are to respect the separation of powers, and that all, people, all the power comes from the people. Okay. Right. Uh, we, you folks both touched on this just a little bit, but in terms of the legislature's choice, we elect our judges. How does that affect your role as a judge? What do you think about a partisan convention about the Republican and Democrat being listed and some of the concerns that might have for how the public views um, the judges who are running for office? What is your sense? Do you like that? If we're going to have elections, is it useful? Uh, would you rather not have it? What do you think? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think if you're worried about um, anything partisan or, or somebody, you know, one way or the other, you shouldn't be a jurist. Um, you know, especially in a state that elects judges, it's in our state constitution. Um, that's the way it's going to be. Um, our, our voters in North Carolina rejected a, a constitutional amendment in 2018 uh, to go to an appointment system. Uh, and knowing my home state, uh, I can't imagine that there'd ever be a time where they um, give up their right to vote on anything. So that's the way it is. Um, the, that's what our law is. The, the you know, specifics around how we conduct the elections as a policy decision. Again, it doesn't matter um, what our party is. And like I said, if, if that has any influence on you, this is not a good job for you. Um, I approach it much like I do as a soldier. Um, I have the flag on my arm. I go in there and do my job as a soldier. I don't go in with any policy agendas. Uh, I very much try to uh, stay out of the fray as much as possible. I'm, I don't, I mean, the last thing I think any of us wants, mostly attorneys here, citizens, uh, litigants in our state, is for a judge to come out and say how they're gonna vote on a case. Um, but you know what, that's, that's not a partisan concern. Uh, that's how we conduct ourselves. Um, yeah, we, we play with the rules that we have. We have them, but we can all control uh, what we control uh, from our foxhole. The, uh, the, the question of, uh, of partisan elections uh, in our state is, is where it is. Um, like I said, we can control what we can control, and that's our own actions. All right, thank you. Justice Riggs? Yeah, we, we agree on the fact that the legislature has decided that this is the way that it's going to be done. I, that's their prerogative and I respect it. I, I try to be transparent with people that I think it does create attention um, for an independent judiciary, um, but I assume it's one that's intended um, and just creates space for voters to exercise um, informed decision making on that front. I think. What is important when we get on the bench is um, listening with an open mind, uh, being very careful not to categorize or um, you know, call into question how you might treat a certain class of litigants, whether it's uh, because of their party affiliation or because of um, the kind of lawsuits they file. So filing constitutional cases, um, that, you know, pursuant to our ethics as attorneys, we have to believe are um, justified and warranted on the law, uh, under the law. I trust every attorney um, to, to exercise um, that judgment. And so I think as a judge and someone who wants to be seen first and foremost um, as a curious thinker and a defender of our constitution, I'm very careful uh, to not dismiss uh, entire kinds of cases that the bar might bring, whether it's business cases, insurance cases, or constitutional cases as political cases. I think that signals 
right from the get-go what you think of a, a group of litigants appearing in front of you. So I think there's work to be done um, if the legislature so chooses to do it, and all I can do is uh, be honest about my perspectives, the challenges and conflicts inherent in the system that we have, um, and allow the decision makers to take that as data and uh, make changes to the system as they see fit. Great. Uh, before we open it up to questions from the floor, if you had a, again, tough little summary here, but sort of main reason folks should vote for you. Yeah. Well, I hope that uh, in my time on the bench, uh, you've gotten to see uh, how I write, how I try and explain the law and make it clear and predictable for practitioners, but also accessible to the vast majority of the electorate that is not a member of this esteemed profession. And I take very seriously that is part of uh, my job and um, look forward to folks getting to uh, judge me on that. But I also um, am someone who has litigated under state and federal constitutions for 15 years. Um, folks may not even know uh, that I have been defense side, plaintiff side, and litigated uh, with Republican members of the Florida legislature for many years because the issues that I cared about weren't partisan, they were about constitutional rights um, and our access to democracy and um, the full range of the liberties and freedoms protected by our state constitution. So I think I have the track record, um, uh, I have a track record that I am proud of um, uh, and have, uh, been happy to and honored to litigate with many of you in the room um, over the years and happy to have friendly sparring in the courtroom and uh, shake hands afterwards. And I think that's a hallmark of the legal profession, one that I've spent uh, many years doing and uh, is an important perspective. As a recent uh, former appellate attorney, I have a lot of respect, since we're in a legal room, um, I have a lot of respect for the work that you all do um, in briefing and in argument and look forward to continuing to show you uh, with my actions and my words how much I appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank Griffin. you all for the venue here. Uh, thank you for, to the Federal Society for allowing us to, to be here and, and share ideas. Um, and my career uh, has been about service uh, service to the state of North Carolina, service to the country. Uh, I hope that uh, citizens here, you included in, in North Carolina, will uh, we'll see that as a, a good place for me to serve at the Supreme Court uh, and further service there. Um, I think I've got a broad range of experience uh, from practicing, uh, from my judicial service uh, at both levels, uh, prosecutorial service, military service, uh, that will be of value uh, to you uh, as attorneys and citizens uh, at the Supreme Court, uh, being able to take what I've articulated to you is how I will conduct myself, how I'll interpret cases, not how I will vote on particular issues, but how I'll interpret cases. And I ask you too, what do you want out of a Supreme Court justice? What do you want for the future of our court system here in North Carolina. And I think one of the things that we would all agree on is that we want to get politics out of our courts. Who do you trust more to do that? Who do you trust more to do that? The person who's served our state, served our country, been able to show uh, I can do that, or the alternative. And I want you to take into account the citizens and everybody here in this room, how we conduct ourselves and how we conduct ourselves campaigning. This, uh, this issue has come up in some of our questions before. Um, we control completely how we conduct ourselves campaigning and what our messages are. And if we follow the code of judicial conduct, I think those are very important issues that we as attorneys and jurors should care about in particular uh, and I think it is, uh, is indicative of how we will carry ourselves on the bench. Uh, so uh, I ask for your support. I appreciate the, uh, the time here today to be able to share with you. Uh, I think we have a lot of 
uh, different ideas, and I think I have a great perspective to bring to the Supreme Court. Thank you, Scott. All right. Thank you both. Uh, we're going to open up uh, for questions. We have 10 or 15 minutes for questions. I'd ask whoever uh, wants to ask a question to uh, identify themselves and then direct their question to the panelists. Thank you. Yes. I'm Dan Gibson, Davis Hartman and Wright. Um, thank you all for being here and for your uh, excellent answers to our questions. My question has to do with the difference between the state constitution and the federal constitution. There are a number of significant differences. The one that most readily comes to mind, for example, is standing in state court versus standing in federal courts. The question is how do we or how should courts navigate the differences when there's a clear textual variant between the national constitution and the state constitution? Who would like to take the first swing? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I'm happy to, Dan. It's great to see you. I, uh, you know, I think the commitment uh, to state constitutionalism is one that um, has significant uh, impact on, on how we practice law in the state and how we practice uh, law nationally. I think there are times where certain lockstepping makes sense or has been decided um, by the court previously. And, you know, I'd, I'd want to be careful um, in overturning precedent, making sure that uh, we're getting to the right answer, not just reflexively uh, changing the rule because we can. But I think they're really different instruments. Uh, I think I don't ever want lockstepping to um, chip away at my ability to understand what our constitution was designed to do and the differences um, that it was designed to create from the federal instrument. And I think that's an incredibly um, wonderful part of our state and our particular state constitution. And so I, I lean into the opportunity to explore those differences in the law um, with a healthy amount of respect for where the jurisprudence currently stands. Um, and what previous courts have decided? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it's been kind of interesting. Uh, as you're aware, the, the fruits of the labor clause that we've got now and, and kind of where that's heading in the developing area of the law. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that we've got uh, those opportunities to, to grow there. I mean, I, 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 I kind of agree with Allison. It's it's not a um, you don't want to co-mingle or, or stake out anything on there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think we'll go uh, pickleball back and forth. So okay. go ahead. Good afternoon, Jason Strickland. Your Honor. Your Honor. There was an election uh, recently in Wisconsin where the partisan makeup of the Supreme Court was the issue in that election. Um, currently, the North Carolina Supreme Court is not. Uh, split 4-3, but if elected, uh, you will be elected to an eight-year term, uh, which means that at some point in the future, there could be a 3-3 three -three partisan divide, and you would be the vote that would determine the partisan bent of the court or the swing vote, or both. Why should you be the vote that determines the partisan makeup or the swing vote or both rather than your opponent thank you you want to take this one first yeah i'll go first this time alternate the no that's bit. that's good um well first i'll i'll uh say i don't know about the partisan makeup we'll, we'll go with uh uh maybe ideological makeup i try to stay away from the partisan uh label i know kyle's down here he, Appreciate that. Um, just because we're Democrat or Republican, I don't think you can assume how we interpret the law. Um, so let's say it's a, uh, I'd be the more conservative minded out of four. Um, I think you can look at, I think what I referenced before, I mean, there's been times in my court um, where I've dissented, um, although more infrequently than my colleagues, um, there's been cases where uh, even Justice Earls <laughs> defended my position at the Supreme Court, uh, which is, yeah, it wasn't free, not frequently, but at times. Um, and so I, I've, 
I'm never going to go into a case or an issue and forecast what I'm going to do there. Uh, and I, that's, that is a violation of our, our uh, judicial code of conduct. Uh, and I take that seriously. Uh, and I keep an open mind about everything uh, that comes before us. Um, and so I think you can trust me as a jurist to do exactly that because nobody in this room wants to think otherwise. Uh, if you do, then I'm sorry. Uh, that's not what I signed up to do as a judge. And I take my oath seriously. Um, so I think it's, if you want somebody who's going to um, rule without fear or favor, who's going to listen to everybody in front of them, uh, who is not going to uh, vote based off partisanship, uh, then I think I should be that person uh, that's in there, the person who's been able to articulate to you actually how I'm going to interpret the law uh, with, so that people in our state know that there's consistency there uh, and, and what I'm doing. It's a, there's not a results-driven method. Thank you. Justice Riggs. Well, this is another one where I'm really um, pleased to be able to point to you, point you to my record uh, on the Supreme Court, which is no longer hypothetical. Um, certainly, I think folks made assumptions um, about how Justice Earls and I might agree um, or vote, and I'm, you know, we don't think alike, even though we are right now the only two Democrats on the North Carolina Supreme Court. I, I don't avoid. I don't apply partisanship in my decision making, but the legislature has decided these are partisan roles. So, you know, it's kind of the elephant in the room, uh, which doesn't necessarily scare me. But I think the record that I have on the North Carolina Supreme Court is one that you can tell. Um, I don't just vote uh, with my colleague who has the same letter uh, behind their name as I do. And instead, I'm looking to. Uh, do the right thing, hear the right thing, and I think that's that's the independence you're looking for. And there's there's just a lot of data out there um, examining patterns in um, in North Carolina, particularly since um, the judicial elections has become partisan. And I'm I'm mm -hmm. proud to be associated with uh, a lot of independence and sometimes uh, disagreement, even amongst. Um, the people you might start out as closely aligned with. Great. Next question, please. Well, thank you, Your Honors, for being here. Uh, Nathan Wilson from the appeals group at Fox. It's a little weird to be asking the questions. <laughs> uh, but my question is, part of judicial philosophy is how you look at precedent and when to depart from past precedent and stare decisis. And I know you can't opine on specifics, but to the extent you can give um, the advocates in the room an idea of when, what considerations you would bring to bear on the question of whether to depart from a past decision, whether one year old or 20 years old? This one's been sure. um, no, it's a great question. And, and this is another one of those places where I wanna be really frank and honest about how challenging those considerations can be in the abstract, um, obviously, which is the legal profession, the people who are governed by the laws in the state depend on some um, consistency and predictability. And I, I think part of how we treat um, precedent is can send messages about our respect for the bench writ large and, and operating and changing over time. But there are also decisions like Korematsu that was wrong the day it was decided. And so I don't think it's one consideration about time. I think it's um, you know considering the stability factor um, that stare decisis offers us, and the interests, the constitutional interests at stake, um, and you know how how wrong at core you believe um, the decision to be, and you have to balance these competing interests. I think the other thing that's important is to grapple with those hard questions on paper so that people can judge for themselves how you weigh those relative factors if they come up. Yeah, I don't think there's a time element necessarily. I mean, if there's a clear error of the law, uh, there's no basis in the law. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's, that's where I'll land on it. All right, great. Please. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, my name is Justin Booker. I'm the president of the Federalist Society at Campbell Law School. Uh, 
What issue springs to your mind immediately whenever you are thinking about uh, state constitutional law versus uh, federal constitutional law? Uh, right now, we have uh, State v. Toronto and State v. Burris in the Supreme Court. Uh, and so I've been doing studies and research into that um, with uh, current appellate issues with Justice Newby. And uh, so, so those have been on my mind recently. So what, I guess, has been on your mind with state versus federal constitutional law? Thank you. Yeah, the, I guess the, there's pending cases at the Supreme Court with um, fruits of the labor clauses, but uh, the one, the last one that I did was, uh, or authored was um, the Ace Speedway case, uh, and that's been resolved. I was, I believe it was unanimous, uh, unanimously affirmed at the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Dietz authored that one. Um, there's a lot, I mean, there's, there's lots of kind of, Differences, but I think that's the most uh, most wide open as far as the difference that, that we're tackling from the appellate bench now. Uh, and I think there's um, a lot of opportunity to highlight particular judicial philosophies and and dig into the history of of that that clause. Not to repeat my answer to Dan's question earlier, but lockstepping is is one that's particularly interesting to me as someone who's litigated cases under the federal equal protection clause and the state equal, protections, equal protection clause, understanding and reconciling cases that we have that, that say the state equal protection clauses were, um, as a practitioner, I wrestled with that because there were cases that suggested more of a lockstepping and then there were cases that suggested, no, there, there was some space and there were more robust protections under the State constitution, I don't have any of those cases in front of me, but intellectually, I think that's so interesting because you know, judicial review in our state predates Marbury. Like we have this rich constitutional history that I get a little um, excited about and I wanna make sure that the words that our, um, the drafters chose for our state constitution, that we're really giving full meaning to them um, and not just matching up our our jurisprudence with the federal jurisprudence. So that's, it's interesting to me. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. All right, um, I'm Connor Fraley, 3L at UNC. My question is one about kind of democratic legitimacy. When we talk about you know, 18th, 19th century, old statutes, old constitutions, that kind of stuff, and you know, updating those to the modern day, is there, in terms of democratic legitimacy, a difference between unelected federal judges elected state judges when it comes to updating that work? I, I certainly imagine that there can be. Um, and I think this is a place where I'm, I'm comfortable understanding that just like we chose different words for our state constitution and meant to have a separate, different process um, that would it's true with our federal system and our state system that um, people may view uh, judges differently in the federal system than they do in the state system. And I assume that that was intended, right? That our, the drafters understood that and they wanted to have judicial elections. The legislature understands that um, <laughs> when, when they make rules for judicial elections here and they don't reflexively think that's a bad thing, but of course, when it comes to interpreting our laws and what it means to be respectful of the separation of powers between the judicial branch and the legislative branch, and what kind of acquiescence to these old laws or ways of understanding the old laws, I'm, I'm comfortable that uh, these are discussions that we should have and frequently have in our decisions when we grapple with these hard issues publicly. Um, it helps us better understand it. And no, no system is rigid. Obviously, Congress can make some decisions consistent with separation of powers about um, you know, the relationship between Congress and uh, the federal judiciary. And obviously, the legislature can make some decisions um, about the relationship between the judiciary and um, the legislative branch here in North Carolina. I think it's there's not a one size fits all. One way is good, one way is bad. One way leads to um, 
democratic legitimacy in one way it doesn't. Uh, I, I employ both and thinking and try and look for what are the ways in which these systems complement each other and how do we educate people about the differences so that they don't think the U.S. their view of the U.S. Supreme Court necessarily dictates the, their view of the North Carolina Supreme Court or vice versa. I think our status as elected officials and elected jurists makes it even more important that we elect people who understand the judicial restraint and separation of powers. Uh, and um, just because we're elected doesn't mean uh, we should step into a different life and branch of government. And so um, that's, that's where I'm all about. Thank you, Beth. One more question. Thank you very much. Sean Harris and Jerry Harris and Anderson and Raleigh. Um, one of the recent changes, you both I'm sure are aware, um, is to eliminate the appeal of right from um, courts of appeals decisions uh, where there was a dissent. And so, you know, which, whichever one of you is elected will, along with the rest of the court, maybe have more control than, you know, the previous eight years over not only how you decide decisions, but what decisions you decide to take. So my question is, you've talked a little bit about your philosophy for deciding cases. Can you talk a little bit about your philosophy for deciding which cases to take, um, particularly when there's no appeal of right? I um, mean, that's going to be something the Supreme Court's going to be doing a lot more of. Jared, you want yeah, to um, I, I mean, obviously, I'm not serving there. Um, however, I think some of the analysis that I use at the Court of Appeals on, um, you know, whether I would sit in a case or um, whether I publish a case probably is instructive on on some of that um yeah at the coa error correcting court uh at the supreme court obviously were the last word there um of interpretation in our state uh so yeah having been a practicing lawyer here uh served as a trial court judge uh and then uh, and the volume of cases we've handled at the court of appeals since i've been there um anything that can clarify the law i think is is that you know one, like what we should look at. Are we making uh, the law more consistent? Uh, are we helping practitioners? Are we helping uh, trial court judges uh, administer justice uh, more efficiently, more effectively, uh, and ultimately uh, with the greatest uh, you know, um, protection for the citizens and litigants that are in front of them? Uh, and so that's that's how I analyze um, what I'm looking at sometimes when I'm making decisions on whether to publish cases or, or, or the level of um, interest it might be in them. But I think that'll translate. Probably that's how I will look at it uh, at the Supreme Court. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I was on the court for a month uh, before that change happened. And so grandfathered in some cases that are were um, afforded a, a right of appeal based on dissent, but shifting slowly but surely to a much more discretionary docket. I think, you know, a lot of the considerations are you know, where and balancing um, the number of cases we are able to hear in any given term, um, what what it takes to get these right, but also get them resolved at a decent clip. Um, you know, I think it's, it's less obvious to the public. I mean, the legal community may, you know, start to see patterns after this has been in place for some time, but, um, yeah, I mean, we, I certainly look for places where it seems like either there's some confusion at the court of appeals or at the trial court level, where can we be helpful? Um, and I, I continue to hope we can figure out a way uh, to translate what a discretionary docket looks like after it's settled. I mean, I think we're still getting used to um, the new rhythms of a more discretionary docket. Um, but I think going back to the role of public education, obviously what um, how we help people understand what kind of cases the Supreme Court takes and considers, um, and that there's a um, almost a two-step decision process in first taking the case and then deciding the case. Um, I'm, I'm interested to continue to approach this thoughtfully. Um, and I think it's, 
we're going to continue to develop this and try and figure out the best new rhythms with a very different uh, way of cases coming in front of us. Well, I want to thank both Justice Riggs and Judge Griffin again for taking the time to be with us and for giving us so much insightful information about their positions, their perspectives, and I'd ask you all to join me in thanking them. <laughs>